Welcome everyone to the first event in the spring 2021 series of the Yale Lectures in Medieval Studies. Uh, we are very glad that you are able to join us today over Zoom. Today's lecture will also be recorded for the sake of those who are not able to attend. My name is Carson Kepke and I will be introducing today's guest speaker. But before I do, I would like to thank our generous sponsors without whose support we would not be able to invite such distinguished uh, speakers from across the country and around the world. Our sponsors include the Archaea Program, the Macmillan Center, the Institute of Sacred Music, the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Divinity School, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Dean's Fund. I would also like to thank my fellow committee members for their help with organizing this event and those to come. They are Theo Breen, Shahruz Khalifian, Larissa Tsukamoto, and Rachel Wilson. Finally, I will take a moment to acknowledge that Yale University stands upon the traditional territories of the Quinnipiac people who were dispossessed of their ancestral homelands. Now, I am honored to introduce our speaker, Professor Tom Berman who serves as Professor of History and Director of the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame. His research and teaching focus on the intellectual and cultural interactions between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the medieval Mediterranean world. He has authored Religious Polemic and the Intellectual History of the Mos Arabs, circa 1050 to 1200, and Reading the Quran in Latin Christendom, 1140 to 1560 as well as numerous articles and translations. He is currently working on a book titled Ramon Marti, The Bookish Religions and Latin Scholasticism. He is also coming out with a new book, The Sea in the Middle, The Mediterranean World, 650 to 1650, which he co-wrote with Brian Katlos and Mark Meyerson. It is scheduled for release in February of 2022 and uh, I am very much looking forward to it, as I'm sure many of you are as well. Today, Professor Berman will be giving a talk entitled The Correspondence of Emperor Leo III and Caliph Umar II, Arguing Mediterranean Religion Across the Middle Ages. Please feel free to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. They will be addressed at the conclusion of the lecture. Thank you very much for agreeing to join us this evening, Professor Berman. I will now yield the floor to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Carson. And uh, let me add my thanks to uh, Alex Pena, who originally invited me last year uh, when I could not come, and to the other uh, graduate students who worked hard to put this together. Um, I'm uh, sorry I can't be on Yale's beautiful campus to deliver this lecture, but it's delightful to be with you uh, through, the, through the virtues uh, of Zoom, as tired as we all are of, of them. Um, uh, now, uh, to begin my lecture, I am going to do two things. I'm going to share my screen uh, to bring up a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I am going to start a uh, timer to make sure that I don't go uh, over time. All right, thank you. So yeah, my title is a little bit uh, wordy and uh, and kind of is a, as a it requires a little explanation of its own. Uh, most of you probably. Many of you have probably never heard of any correspondence between uh, the Christian Emperor, Byzantine Emperor Leo III, and the uh, Caliph Umar II. Um, but there are texts, uh, several of them, that survive from the Middle Ages that claim to be parts of that correspondence. And this correspondence um, is uh, essentially an apologetic polemic correspondence where each uh, these figures um, tries to persuade the other to uh, abandon his religion and and uh, take on it, it, its competitor. Um, 
And uh, these uh, various texts show up in uh, all over the Mediterranean, uh, intriguingly enough, and across the whole period from the eighth century uh, to uh, the um, uh, early 16th century. Um, so uh, I should note uh, to start with that the presentation I'm giving now is dependent on the work of what is a collaborative project uh, that I have been involved in for the last four or five years. Um, and um, we, are, we are calling it for the moment, whoops, sorry about that, um, a connecting polemic, uh, the correspondence of Umar II Leo, and Leo III, editions and translations. Um, it's a collaborative project because these uh, various versions of what claim to be this correspondence show up in many languages. So I wanna mention briefly my collaborators um, uh, whose work, uh, uh, so much of what I will be saying is dependent upon. Sergio Laporta, one of the really fine uh, armenologists in North America right now. Um, Alison Vaca, a former colleague of mine at the University of Tennessee, who's both an Islamic historian and armenologist, an expert on Islam in, um, in uh, Armenia. Uh, Nuria de Castilla, who um, teaches Arabic codicology at the Ecole Pratique in, in Paris, but is also a great expert on uh, al Hamiyado texts, those remarkable texts written in Castilian, but, for, but in the Arabic alphabet. Uh, and one of the versions that survives is in al Um uh, Jeremy Pearson, uh, who's a medieval historian and a former student of mine, has, has worked with me on the Latin versions uh, of this text. And uh, Seong Yong Kim, uh, a very young scholar um, who uh, finished her PhD at, at Catholic University only a few years ago, uh, wrote a dissertation about one of the, the versions of this text uh, that we'll encounter a little bit later. So collectively, we are editing and translating uh, all of these texts to publish uh, in, a, in a single volume. Um, let me give you an overview of what I'll be saying today. Um, I wanna give you some sense of the character and versions and dispersion of these, of these texts, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm imagining that most of you will not have uh, uh, heard of these. Um, and uh, just uh, briefly uh, kind of uh, after that, say a few things about one of the most striking facts about them, that they are in general, hugely different from each other. Um, these, these texts are classic open texts that everybody who uh, touched them thought that they could fiddle with them and happily uh, rewrote, reworked and revised uh, often extensively as they did so. And then in the second half of my talk, um, I want to address the question of what do they have in common, partly because I think there are, there are a couple really interesting things uh, to come out of that, uh, one having to do with a particular line of, of, um, of early Muslim argumentation against uh, Christianity, but the other, um, uh, and, the, and, these, and this, this appears in a, in a few common arg argumentative strands that show up in every version, despite the great differences uh, among them. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, and I think more importantly, uh, uh, re remarkably enough, all of these versions of the, of the text kind of collectively imagine um, that this Christian Muslim argument will never end. Um, they, they collectively give this impression. And, and I think that's something very important for us as we think about the medieval Mediterranean. Um, and I'm going to make the somewhat controversial claim um, that this, um, this, this sense that uh, Christians and Muslims are involved in a never ending discussion is one of the things that actually unifies uh, the Mediterranean in a, in, a, in a real meaningful way, despite the fact that these texts are also meant to divide it up um, very clearly between uh, Christians and Muslims. So that's an overview of, of what I'll be saying. Uh, and let me start by 
giving you a little bit of sense of what these texts are like and of their dispersion uh, across the Mediterranean. The, the oldest uh, version that, of the text that, that survives is an Armenian version uh, translated from Greek in the late uh, 8th century. And you see an image here of uh, the earliest manuscript, which actually is much later. It's a 13th century manuscript. Uh, but the text is clearly um, from, from the 8th century um, in Erevan. Um, and uh, I thought I would use uh, this version of the correspondence uh, to give you some flavor of, of what this um, exchange of letters uh, uh, looked like in at least one of the versions of it. Uh, in this case, we have both the, a letter of Omar and a letter of Leo side by side. And in the Armenian version, uh, the Omar's le letter is uh, very short. Um, and it begins with this, um, this uh, sort of uh, complaint that many times have I wanted to know the teaching of your Leo's supposed faith, and we have applied ourselves to learn what you really think, yet it has not been possible for us to comprehend it. So now tell me the truth. Um, and and this, um, this beginning is followed up then um, by, uh, now wait a second, why is my Oh, I think I see why, yeah, by a series, a short series of questions. Um, so in this version, Umar asks Leo, why not accept what Jesus says about himself in the gospels rather than searching the prophets and the Psalms and the rest of the Hebrew Bible for ideas about incarnation and, and Trinity and uh, these other scandalous Christian uh, doctrines. Uh, furthermore, he asks, the, the, the question, why follow the Hebrew scriptures at all? Since uh, they, uh, they, quote, were captured many times and destroyed and are thus unreliable, um, why bother with them? And uh, he says that uh, you, you Christians uh, also change all of, the, uh, all of the old laws and rituals. So Jewish circumcision becomes baptism and sacrifice becomes Eucharist. Saturday worship becomes Sunday worship. And, uh, and that's about the substance of uh, Umar's uh, letter in this version from the late eighth century. Leo's <clears throat> much, much longer response. In fact, the Armenian uh, letter of Leo is the longest version of Leo's letter that, that survives. Uh, addresses most of these points uh, at considerable length, uh, arguing that um, the Psalms and prophets are, 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 have always been uh, essential to Christian belief. Um, and uh, you, you one really can't be a Christian without uh, subscribing to the, uh, um, to the uh, notion that the Hebrew Bible is, uh, is, has become the Christian Bible. Um, he argues uh, strenuously that the New and Old Testaments do not contradict each other. Um, and, and he points out that in fact, Jews and Christians disagree on many things, but they agree on the text of the Old Testament. Uh, this is a, a kind of a response to um, a, a notion that doesn't come out strongly in any of the Muslim versions uh, of these texts of uh, Taharif, of, uh, of the corruption of uh, the Christian and Jewish scriptures, um, at least as, as concerns the Christian uh, New Testament. Um, and then he presents uh, as the other uh, versions of uh, the Leo letter do uh, lists of prophetic testimonies. These are, these are proof texts of Christ's advent and incarnation and suffering and so on. Um, and, and tells us that uh, we, we change the laws and rituals because Jeremiah himself in the Hebrew Bible foretold a new covenant uh, that would have, have new laws and rituals. And, and at the very end, he attacks uh, Islam directly for 
the demonic practices that go on in the Kaaba in, in Mecca and for concubinage and other such things. So that sort of a, a, a gives you a little bit of a flavor of what this correspondence uh, is about. And by the way, nobody thinks that either Leo or Umar, uh, the real uh, caliph and emperor, had anything to do with writing any of the versions of, of, of this. Uh, they, they are uh, clearly uh, the work of somebody else who's attributing to them, attributing them to uh, a major spokesman of uh, their own religion. So uh, if we look at the dispersion of this text, oops, wrong direction. Um, we find the, the, the Armenian version from Greek uh, in 788 and uh, 89 or so um, that contains both letters. Um, strikingly enough, the next uh, version of the text shows up at the opposite end of the Mediterranean um, in Al-Andalus um, in a Latin version of Leo's letter um, that was clearly translated from Arabic uh, in Al-Andalus uh, sometime in the early um, ninth century. Um, and um, um, it, it, uh, it survives uh, a little bit unusually in four manuscripts. In most of the other versions of this text, we have a single manuscript in which it survives. So this is a, it, another interesting thing about this correspondence. It, 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 kind of barely um, made it to the present, um, but the earliest manuscript of this Latin version uh, was copied, amazingly enough, um, in the south of France uh, before 850, uh, though the translation was made uh, uh, in Al-Andalus uh, quite clearly. Um, a century later or so, we have a Muslim Arabic version um, of Omar's letter, uh, that survives in a, in a substantial fragment, but clearly fragmentary form um, uh, of a manuscript that was for a long time in the great mosque in Damascus and now is in um, Istanbul. Uh, at about the same time, we have a Christian Arabic um, version of Leo's letter um, that was probably copied somewhere near Jerusalem or uh, yeah, uh, uh, composed um, and the actual uh, manuscript copied somewhere near Jerusalem, but it has survived to the present in uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And then interestingly enough, if we jump uh, uh, rather later in the Middle Ages, we find it again, uh, a letter, this time the, the, a version of Umar's letter uh, in al um, uh in about 1450 or so. And uh, this Muslim al hamiado and this Muslim Arabic text are the only versions of this text that have a fairly close relationship to each other. In fact, they seem to have originally been a single uh, text because um, at, the, um, at the beginning of the Muslim al hamiado text, we have an overlap with the end of the Muslim Arabic one, and, and it's clearly a, trans, a direct translation from that Arabic version. Um, so they must have been one uh, single text at some point. And then uh, early, in the, early in the next century, um, it shows up again, uh, interestingly enough, in France, uh, in a revised Lat, uh, uh, Latin version, uh, this, this uh, ninth century Latin version is reworked by a, an eccentric, a medical um, humanist named Symphorian Champier and published in, a, in uh, one of the mini volumes of all sorts of miscellaneous works that he was fond of, of having printed. Um, so it's a, a set of texts that surround the whole uh, Mediterranean and cross um, a great deal of um, time. Um, and, uh, and oddly enough, uh, it, it, despite this great dispersion, uh, in no case um, is, uh, are there a lot of manuscripts of this text, um, with the exception, I should add, of the Armenian. But the Armenian version of the letters survives only uh, in the middle of a very important Armenian chronicle of the early period of Islamic history. 
Um, and uh, that survives in about 20 manuscripts. Um, but it seems pretty clear uh, to the team working on these that, that, um, that it was copied so frequently because of the chronicle and not because of the letters. Um, so it's a widespread text, but, uh, but uh, never one that, that, that survives in, in a whole lot of copies. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll come a, a little bit later to some, um, uh, at least some um, uh, ideas about why that might be so. Um, so there, there are big differences between uh, the versions of this text. Um, um, and, and let's start with Leo's letter, uh, just to, to uh, um, uh, start somewhere. Um, the Christian Arabic and the Latin versions of Leo's letter are much, much shorter than the Armenian, and they have very different content. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, they are entirely disconnected text, although we will see that there are um, some strands of argument that show up in both and, uh, and a few other commonalities. Um, but uh, they, they really in textually have uh, virtually nothing to do with each other. Um, moreover, the Latin version, as I said, was translated from an Arabic version and it clearly uh, came from a Melkite context, the Arabic original that it was translated from, as does the Arab uh, Christian version that survives in Sinai. Um, but it is not a translation of that version in Sinai. Um, there are considerable differences between the two of them, though they share some common um, source texts, perhaps, uh, in common. Um, so none of the letters of Leo are identical to each other um, and, and are in many ways quite different from each other. If we think of Umar's letter, we find much the same thing. The, the, the overlapping al Hamiyado and Muslim Arabic versions are, are much, much longer than the Armenian version. Um, and the Armenian's content, the Armenian version's content is much different as well. So they, in a lot of ways, feel like they're entirely separate texts as well, though each purports to be this letter from Umar uh, to Leo. Um, so a widely dispersed text uh, across time and place, um, uh, widely dispersed set of texts across time and place uh, with, with uh, very uh, remarkable differences between uh, the versions. Um, they do have some things in common, uh, however. Um, um, and one is that um, they are, uh, um, I would say, um, a pop, what we might call a popular polemical corpus. These are not sophisticated, um, um, elaborate, um, um, elite written works, um, but, uh, but intended for something more like what Jack Tanus has recently called uh, the simple believers um, uh, uh, in his, his recent book about the making of the Middle East. Um, and uh, one, one of the several signs of this is that there's no complicated theology or philosophy in these texts um, at all. Um, uh, and we don't have anything like uh, sort of the sophisticated uh, philosophy or theology or kalam um, that we find in, in, um, in other um, Muslim uh, uh, critiques of, of, of Christianity, say in Ibn Taymiyyah's huge Jawab um, al-Sahih, or, or uh, the kind of philosophical uh, and theological sophistication that we find the other end of the Mediterranean in, in Ramon Wool's um, many treatises against Islam and, and, and in Ramon Marti, uh, for example. Um, furthermore, all of the versions lack anything like uh, literary quality. Uh, the, these are not beautiful texts. They are not written beautifully. Um, then, in fact, um, uh, many of them uh, involve quite awkward uh, uh, constructions, um, uh, sometimes because they're translated from another language, but uh, sometimes because uh, the, uh, the people who translated them really weren't all that good at the language they were working in. This is particularly true 
of the Latin version, which um, has all kinds of, uh, of problematic uh, Latin in it. Um, so uh, it's a kind of a popular polemical corpus. And I think this may be one of the reasons why uh, it seems in some senses so ephemeral. Um, we have a single copy here, a single copy there, a couple copies over somewhere else. Um, it's a sort of a text that I kind of imagine existing on the borderline between um, uh, oral and, and written. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, not one that um, because of, of this lack of sophistication, uh, a lot of people thought was suitable to write down in a manuscript. But uh, there are uh, two uh, commonalities in particular that I want to um, devote uh, the rest of my attention to today. Um, one um, uh, has to do with um, uh, a, a common set of uh, arguments that we at least find gestured at, sometimes uh, worked out more fully um, in every one of the versions of the correspondence. Um, and these uh, common strands or threads of argument uh, uh, derive, uh, we think, from the 45th through 51st verse of uh, the third surah of the Quran. Um, as if somebody was kind of using, an early um, Muslim was using this as a kind of a, um, um, a uh, foundation for making arguments against Christianity. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of uh, examples of these common strands of argument, uh, which I think add up to a rather um, uh, unusual um, argument in the history of Christian Muslim uh, relations. Um, so the first is that the letters of Omar uh, all in one way or another say that Jesus was near to God and what he said should be believed rather than the corrupt Old Testament prophecies. And we already saw that um, in the, the letter of uh, Omar in the Armenian uh, case. This um, uh, seems to be based on a couple of verses of Surah 3, um, 45 and 46 that talk about Jesus telling us among other things that his name is uh, the Christ Jesus son of Mary and greatly honored in this world and the next and among those drawn nearest to God, a very striking Quranic phrase, those drawn nearest to God. Um, and uh, so if we turn to the al Hamiado version um, of uh, Umar's letter, and, and there you see a manuscript page uh, of it uh, that will, uh, if, you're, if you're used to reading Arabic or Persian in the Arabic script, um, this, uh, this Castilian in um, Arabic script will drive you crazy. It, it kind of drives me crazy, um, I have to confess. Uh, and, um, and we have this claim put forward. Jesus knew himself better and was closer to God and more to be believed than the scriptures of the nations, which have been distorted and, and so on. So here's this claim um, that the uh, al Hamiyado Umar is making um, to, um, the, to, to Leo. Um, the Armenian version of the, of, uh, the uh, a letter of, of Umar also makes this claim. And remember that they are very far apart in content otherwise, but it also makes a claim with similar language. But Jesus was truly worthy of confidence for he was close to God. He knew himself better than do the scriptures which peoples whom you do not know have changed and corrupted. Um, so despite the fact that those two versions of Umar's letter are in, in most ways utterly different, uh, we do have this assertion made about Jesus being close to God. Um, all of the uh, versions of Leo's letter, uh, the Christian Arabic, the Latin and the Armenian, um, uh, refer to this um, argument and, um, uh, and uh, refute it uh, usually kind of indirectly um, in the uh, course of their letters 
uh, not all in, in one go, uh, as it were. Um, but uh, the Armenian version, for example, says, you wrote that Jesus was truly worthy of, tr tr of trust for he was close to God. Um, and so um, that idea, um, that strand of argumentation shows up in every single version of this, uh, of this correspondence, uh, uh, both the Muslim Umar letters and the Christian Leo letters all, all refer to this um, argument. A second and related um, argument, that strand of argument that shows up every, in every text is that the Hebrew Bible and the gospel or gospels, I guess, depending on whether you're thinking of them uh, from a Muslim or a Christian perspective, uh, disagree with each other. Um, and the point is they shouldn't. Um, and so the versions of the, uh, well, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Th this seems to um, be based on um, uh, the 50th verse of the third surah where um, Jesus says among many other things, I confirm what lies before me of the Torah and the letters of, of Umar uh, that survived take this to mean that, that what Jesus, the revelation that Jesus brought in the Injil in the gospel should be in agreement with what is in the Torah. And so the al Hamiyad al-Umar again uh, uh, raises this point. According to your views, the Torah and the gospel differed in many things. And if not, why did you and the Jews change it and dispute, and dispute with each other? The Torah and the gospel should not disagree with each other. Um, once again, the, uh, all of the uh, Christian versions of the Leo letter uh, respond uh, to this um, assertion. Um, I have before you here a, uh, a single page of the uh, St. Catherine's uh, um, manuscript that contains the Arab Christian version of the Leo letter. Um, and, um, and she, uh, the, or the author of, uh, of this version of the text has a great deal to say about that claim. You will find, uh, he says in the Hebrew scriptures and the gospel alike, a clear instruction and a correct path regarding the issue of Christ. You will be pleased with it and will, and will be beyond doubt when you see that the scriptures of God confirm one another, that is the Hebrew Bible and the gospel. Um, um, even agreeing about Christ, whom God sent. Um, so uh, as a matter of fact, according to the various versions of Leo, um, um, uh, the, 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 the Old and the New Testament are in com complete uh, uh, agreement with each other, especially about matters uh, Christological. So uh, the collective argument of these, these core strands, which sometimes are hinted at, sometimes just referred to, sometimes worked out more broadly in the various versions, adds up to something that, that is uh, really, uh, in my experience, fairly unusual in Muslim argumentation uh, uh, against Christians, that Christians um, should um, avoid the whole Old Testament and leave it out of their... Uh, of their beliefs and practices and, and heed only Jesus's words in the gospel. Now, the reason for this claim is that of course, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, there are um, uh, a number of places in the gospels where Jesus talks about having a Lord and returning to his Lord and, and seems to be speaking as if he were a prophet. Um, what's unusual about this, I think, is that it doesn't take very long in the history of, of Muslim uh, polemic against Christianity before um, um, the notion uh, that Christians should rely on the gospel is tossed out as well. Because first of all, there are four of them and they disagree with each other um, in a whole number of ways and they can't be reliable. And so both the Hebrew Bible and the gospels uh, have suffered from corruption. And so Christians shouldn't believe what's in the Bible at all. Uh, this makes this, I think, a relatively primitive argument, uh, uh, a rather early argument. And, and, and since the early versions of this text are, are from the 8th century, 
Um, I think we might we might expect that, and it and it also may again have something to do with the popular nature of these texts. That this 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 kind of argument, which would would it, it fairly soon become um, something you would not see in 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 Muslim argumentation, would be uh, would, uh, would 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 be, would be avoided. Um, but there's something else in common, and I think more important. Uh, 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 then that that common strand of those common strands of uh, argumentation that unite the the various versions, and and that is um, that they collectively imagine that this religious dis disputation that they're involved in is sort of never ending. Uh, that is, if we enter into the universe of these writers. Um, of the various versions, we find over and over kind of uh, suggestions that um, on the one hand, it's not clear where this correspondence began, who actually started it. So its beginning is sort of lost in time and that it has involved a whole bunch of letters um, and that Leo and, and, and Umar have been going on about this, uh, writing letters back and forth for some time and that there doesn't seem to be a clear ending to this process. Uh, we see this most vividly um, in, in a, a, a kind of two features um, of the correspondence. Um, the first, well, the first is this, is the fact that the, yeah, the, 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 the exchange of letters itself seems to have no clear ending and no clear beginning uh, either. Uh, and we see this evidenced especially by um, um, uh, several of the, of the versions. Uh, the Armenian Leo begins by noting that Umar wrote all of these disputations and many more to Leo. For that reason, it was necessary for the Emperor Leo to respond. Um, so uh, here is one of the versions of Leo claiming that um, this, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, and uh, the Arab Christian version of the Leo letters, uh, Leo letter uh, uh, implies much the same. And I'm um, just gonna have to move uh, the video box here so I can uh, read this out. Uh, uh, as for what you asked us about the matter of the Christian religion, it is the same as I have described to you in my letter, in a letter that was written before. And what I have explained to, to you and written to you about the issue of Adam. So we seem to have here again an implication of many letters having been exchanged. We find the same exact same set of claims from the other side as well. Um, so the Al Hamiyado Muslim Umar um, at the beginning. Uh, says, inasmuch as you, Leo, have written to me many letters in which you have spoken about the matter of Jesus, I do not know what has made you write me again. Like, what's, what's going on? You've already written and written and written me. Why are you writing me again? Um, so there's this sense of um, the, the, the correspondence. Uh, we're actually entering in medias res uh, into this correspondence and uh, none of the versions um, that survive give the feel of being the, the last word uh, on, uh, on the subject. And moreover, there are other little bits of uh, evidence in most of the versions of the letter that suggest the same thing that, um, and it will be just a, a little phrase, as I told you in my previous letter, and then, then Omar or Leo will say something as I wrote to you before, and then they'll say something like that. Um, okay. But there's a second thing that suggests, uh, to my mind, uh, the same, the same um, kind of never ending quality to the discussion that's going on. And that is what um, I, I call argumentative incompleteness. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is the fact that 
uh, in many versions uh, of the letter, and this is particularly true of the, of the letters uh, ascribed to Leo, um, we find uh, that um, um, uh, arguments are gestured at or a proof text is given, but no argument is fully developed to support why um, uh, this thing should be true or not. Um, and so strikingly enough in the Armenian and Latin Leos, and, and, and again, remember these are very, very different texts uh, otherwise, uh, in a list of prophecies of the coming of, of Christ, um, we find a quotation of uh, the first verse of, of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies at your feet. And without any argumentation to tell us why this verse, which on the face of it has nothing to do um, with uh, Christian Muslim um, argumentation uh, or with uh, Christ's advent or anything like that. No argumentation to tell us why this is so. Now, um, many of you will know that um, if you're familiar at all with, with Jewish Christian uh, disputation in the late antique and medieval period, um, and uh, or uh, more familiar with, with Christian Muslim disputation, that this verse does come up um, in this context, but normally it's unpacked a lot. Um, and the unpacking begins with observing the fact that we have this strange introductory phrase, the Lord said to my Lord. Um, now this is troublesome, um, a troublesome phrase for both Jews and Christians. How can God, um, the Lord, say to his Lord anything? Uh, does this mean that, that, that God has a, another Lord? Um, what is going on here? Now, in fact, in the Hebrew uh, original, these are two different words. Um, uh, uh, the first Lord is the Tetragrammaton, um, and the second is Adonai. Uh, but in the versions um, that, uh, that all of these various um, uh, uh, authors of these uh, 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 supposed corresponding texts are using translate both words as Lord, uh, just as the Vulgate uh, does, uh, for example. Um, and um, in fact, Christians uh, learned uh, early on um, something that, that, that helped them uh, construct uh, a, a, a very Christian argument uh, out of this verse. They observed uh, that the ancient Aramaic versions of the Hebrew Bible, the Targum, the Targum, Targumim, um, translated the second Lord, the Adonai, as Memra, as the word. Uh, so that in the Targum, uh, the, the verse says, the Lord said to my word. And you can just imagine um, how Christians would jump on this saying, oh, here's an allusion to the Trinity. Um, it's also an allusion to the second person of the Trinity, the Word, who is, uh, who is Christ, and therefore, um, if you know all of that, uh, you know that this is a, um, an, arg a, 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 an argument for the coming of Christ. Um, but we don't have any of that in either version, uh, in the Armenian or the Latin. Uh, so uh, argumentative in incompleteness. And we find uh, similar cases, uh, though not as commonly, in the versions of Umar's letter. Uh, but uh, for example, in the Armenian uh, version, in the middle of a paragraph, um, we find this uh, sentence uh, thrust in, the paraclete that Jesus will send, as it says in the gospels, is none other than Muhammad. Um, there's nothing before this sentence in the um, uh, paragraph that has anything to do with the paraclete and nothing that comes after it has anything to do with paraclete at all. It's just like Psalm uh, 110.1 thrust into this 
a list of otherwise unrelated stuff. Now, um, those of you who know um, uh, Islamic uh, uh, apologetic and, and polemic against Christianity will know why this is uh, in here. There is a long complicated argument that is developed partly philologically and partly in other ways um, that when the Gospel of John mentions the paraclete whom Jesus will send, um, that paraclete is to be understood as Muhammad. Um, and that is an argument that is indeed brought out uh, in many, many um, uh, Islamic uh, um, uh, texts against Christianity or trying to persuade uh, Christians to become Muslims. But here there's no, uh, no context, no uh, argumentation to support the assertion. And uh, this, I think, gives the, uh, it added to the fact that we have this uh, imagined um, uh, set of many letters being written kind of adds to the sense of incompleteness of this whole process. Uh, uh, because it's, it's, it suggests that um, the script is, is widely known, um, that you don't, you don't actually have to know all of the details to understand, uh, all the details of argumentation to understand what's being said uh, because all of that information is circulating in some oral form al already. Um, and uh, so collectively, um, what are we to make of this uh, seeming imagined endlessness uh, to the correspondence, uh, imagined endlessness uh, that um, shows up in, in, in all of the versions? Uh, and, and here's uh, where I want to make perhaps a controversial claim. Of course, it's true um, that, um, that many, many things divide the medieval Mediterranean. Um, in the textbook that, that Mark Meyerson and Brian Catalos and I have, have, have finished, we, we, are, we stress that uh, the, the Mediterranean is not a single unified culture at all. Uh, uh, but there are many things that unite it uh, as well. And, um, uh, and by the way, some of the things that, that, that divide uh, the Mediterranean are polemical texts just like these that draw boundaries. But uh, the same polemical texts gesture toward a, a kind of a surprising, intriguing, unifying reality of the Mediterranean, uh, a reality that is um, a never ending argument uh, between uh, uh, Christians and Muslims whose script is very well known. Uh, so that um, kind of wherever you go uh, in, in, especially the Southern Mediterranean, but in other parts as well, uh, whether you're in, um, in Constantinople or uh, Antioch or Jerusalem or Cairo or Cairo um, or Toledo or uh, Barcelona, or even Southern France, as we saw, um, you're likely to bump into or overhear or uh, become part of, become drawn into this never, this seemingly never ending argument. Um, and, and this is part of what it meant to be um, um, a denizen of the, of, the, of the medieval Mediterranean was this constant background noise of Christian Muslim uh, disputation that goes on um, century after century. Um, I think I'll stop there now and thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to uh, whatever comments or questions you might have. Right. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, Professor Berman. Um, it was fascinating in so many ways. Um, I would like now to address the um, questions that people have posted in the Q&A. Uh, I will read them aloud, uh, and then if you could um, answer them, please, afterwards. Uh, so the first one, uh, which comes from an anonymous uh, attendee, asks, were letters received from Umar written in Arabic and then translated into Latin by Leo's translators and vice versa? How were letters translated and were there mistranslations? Uh, well, um, the first part was uh, 
are, are the letters from Umar translated from um, from from Arabic uh, in the uh, by by the people who were were translating the the letters of Leo? Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. That well, that 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 does not seem to be the case. Um, the, the versions of the Umar letter, especially the overlapping al Hamiado and an Arabic version, um, that Arabic version seems to be an original version of the text um, um, uh, in, in Arabic and not written in another language and translated into Arabic. And then it's translated um, into al Hamiado, but by Muslims for Muslim consumption. Um, the version of Umar that is attached to the beginning of um, the Armenian version, um, most scholars think is, a, is, is a, an add-on after by Christian. It's probably uh, not by a Muslim at all. It's probably by a Christian who wanted to give um, a, 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 a Umarian context uh, to what Leo says uh, afterwards. Um, and, and, and of course, there were errors in translation. Um, uh, that that just goes without saying. Uh, translation translation is hard work, and um, and we we find uh, that uh, um, in in all of the versions, um, and uh, especially, uh, but it, but it is remarkable, uh, I must say. Um, if, for example, one looks at the um, the Quranic citations in the Latin version of, of Leo's letter, um, uh, that's something that we, we, uh, we can actually compare directly uh, to an Arabic text uh, that exists. And here in the, in the ninth century in Al-Andalus, uh, there's a translator who, who does a very good job of, of translating these, um, these uh, Quranic verses, though he does, uh, he does tend to give a little bit of a Christian spin to them uh, now and then. Okay, thank you. Uh, the following question comes from Jamie Chandler and Jamie asks, are there any indications in the Muslim Arabic or Christian Arabic texts that such letters ever made it into other Near Eastern languages, uh, for example, Syriac or Coptic? Yeah. Yeah, this is a question we've asked ourselves many times, and uh, there's been speculation um, before, from before we began this project that uh, there must have been a Syriac version uh, of some sort uh, floating around. Uh, we've never found it, um, uh, and it is interesting that the, um, that the Christian Arabic uh, uh, text that we know of uh, emerge either in an Ar Armenian context or in a Melkite context, um, uh, not in a, um, in a Syrian Christian context. But there are suggestions uh, in the um, Arabic version of the Umar letter that um, uh, it's pretty clear that he is using a version of the Bible um, that uh, was originally translated from uh, Syriac. So um, there are sort of these hints here and there that there may have been a Syriac version somewhere. And, and it would, it's frankly kind of surprising to me that we, we, no one's ever come across this. And it's easily possible that there would be a Coptic version too, but we, we know of no such text. Although of course uh, these could be discovered uh, later. Okay, thank you. Well, now that we know about this uh, corpus of texts, everyone can keep an eye out for Syriac and Coptic versions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, do you or your collaborators believe that iconoclasm or iconodualism played any particular role in the genesis of this particular set of popular polemics? Um, I think not. Uh, there, I, I don't think there's uh, anything to suggest um, that that is an important context uh, uh, in which, say, the Greek version was written. Of course, we don't have that Greek version, and and the Armenian version may not uh, be. It, it it may itself be 
a revised uh, translation. And, and there, if we had the Greek, maybe maybe we'd have a better sense uh, of that. But um, there's nothing um, in any of the versions to suggest that the iconoclastic controversy had, had much of a role here. OK, thank you. Um, so Alex Pena uh, has asked the next question. He says, thank you for this fascinating talk. How would you describe the relationship between the enduring popularity of these texts alongside the more learned traditions of dialectical polemics or polemic texts such as pseudo Alkindi, Petrus Alfonsi, and others that form their own insularized textual tradition? Is there direct evidence that these traditions were in dialogue with each other or read by the same audiences? Um. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, um, certainly, um, well, uh, I, we know of no evidence yet that's, that is clear that any of these versions was read by um, um, by what we might think of as, as uh, well, no, that, that's not quite true. We, we do have one intriguing bit of evidence of um, the, the Leo's letter being uh, um, included in, the, in, a, in an otherwise uh, um, quite uh, erudite anthology of texts, um, most of them from um, the pre-Islamic uh, Iberia. So everywhere the in all four manuscripts where the Latin Leo shows up, it shows up just after um, uh, St. Isidore's um, um, uh, work, uh, De Fide Catholica Contra Judeus as, as like the Islamic add-on to it. Um, and so there, though St. Isidore's text is a much more uh, complex, much more erudite kind of thing, uh, it, 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 it has the feel that uh, this was the best thing they could get their hands on to supplement it with. Um, so there we see it kind of crossing boundaries between um, what we might think of as elite intellectual circles and more popular circles. Um, but I, I think that uh, part of the reason uh, to get to the other part of the question that these things survive is that, you know, we, we have evidence um, uh, of, of uh, non-scholarly uh, uh, disputation going on um, in, in the Middle Ages. So we have the uh, so-called uh, disputation of Majorca um, in the 13th century um, in which an Italian merchant um, has a series of religious discussions with uh, a couple of rabbis um, who, uh, among other things, make fun of him for not having a proper religious education. So, you know, here and there we have, we have evidence that um, it wasn't just uh, the learned um, uh, scholars who, who engaged in discussion, that or relatively ordinary people um, discussed religion uh, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's, that would be my explanation for, for why and it survives and, and spread throughout the Mediterranean. Um, and yes, there are some signs of, of it crossing uh, the boundary the, 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 uh, be, between learned and, and, and non-learned uh, um, um, discourse. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Kevin Van Bladel has posed the following question. Um, he says, Thank you for this research. My question is why one thinks automatically that this is a spurious text, not somehow a publicized excerpt of the correspondence of rival monarchs. Uh, you explained that it appears in translation after about 60 years from the death of Umar II. This is arguably not something that would have been fabricated and put forward after the um, Abbasids came to power in 750. It is indisputable. Uh, its indisputable Quranic references, which you rightly point out, suggested genuine Muslim source. If this is not from Umar II, a caliph uh, commemorated for his conspicuous 
Quran written piety, specific foreign policy and attempted reform, is it not at least from an early eighth century Muslim close to his time? Uh, is the assumption that this could not have been due to do in some respects to Umar II himself or a secretary of his um, uh, uh, simply that such a find would be too good to be true. If you are right about the never ending Mediterranean dispute, surely Umar II could have participated. No, uh, or have I misunderstood you on this point? No, 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 no that, well, that's a very good question. And um, uh, uh, I think uh, certainly the, uh, the earliest version of the Umar letter, whatever it was, um, was written by a Muslim. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, the, the, the version that I don't think, that we don't think was written by a Muslim is the one that's attached to the Armenian version. Um, um, but the, uh, the uh, Arabic uh, al hamniyadu uh, text um, was uh, very clearly written by a Muslim, although uh, uh, intriguingly enough, it's uh, uh, copied in a manuscript um, and the copyist of the manuscript seems to have been a Christian, which of course wasn't that unusual, uh, but it's, it's clearly a text written by a Muslim and, it, and, it, and perhaps it goes back to, to Umar himself, uh, but there's been a great deal of discussion about this in earlier literature. And um, as I said, most scholars doubt that, um, that either um, Leo or, or Umar uh, played a real role in this. Um, and it, but it could certainly be somebody in, in, in Umar's uh, circle um, uh, who originally composed that. But then that leads us to the question of, uh, do we think Leo uh, the third uh, wrote um, the, uh, the, 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 the Christian response? And that I think is even less likely uh, than, that, than that Umar. Uh, uh, wrote the the uh, original version, and all and all this were hampered by the fact that there simply is no urtext to be found, other than these few strands of argumentation that they have in common. Um, so I hope I've uh, addressed that uh, sufficiently. It, 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 I mean, I, th I think it's possible. I just think it's a lot less likely. Um, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of texts in the Middle Ages are ascribed to other people for for the kinds of reasons, reasons I mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, Kristen Herdman um, has uh, posted the following. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I was curious, as this appears to be the work of a number of different authors, interlocutors and translators, does the material manuscript record have any indication of how the process of composition and translation proceeded? Well, Yeah, uh, the manuscripts themselves, I would, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I would say the manuscripts themselves don't tell us very much about the composition um, or, the, or, the, or the process of translation. Um, um, and in this we're hampered a lot by uh, not having, um, except in that case of the overlap of the Alhami and the Arabic uh, Muslim Umar, not having any, any single uh, case of a whole text being copied from another text that we know exists. So um, we, we, can't, um, we can't set the versions down side by side and compare them. Uh, to get a sense of uh, what the translators uh, sort of um, modus operandi were. Um, uh, and um, um, I can tell you uh, uh, in the case of the Latin Leo, um, in, in the passages where um, it, it does share a source with the Arabic Christian one, um, there are often um, uh, sentences or s significant um, passages that the Latin looks like it's a direct translation of, um, and it looks very much like that Latin translator knew what he was doing with the Arabic, although he didn't quite know what he was doing with the Latin, because we have all kinds of problems with case endings and 
gender and, and other things. Um, so uh, the, the nature of the corpus itself doesn't allow us to say very much about either of those uh, questions, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Meredith Ringel has posted the following. Uh, she says, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I'm curious to know how the idea of imagined endless, endlessness of religious disputation squares with preaching manuals and proselytization, i.e., what is the point of preaching to the infidel if religious disputation will never end? Uh, that's a, it's a good question. Um, um, uh, one thing I can say is uh, that uh, disputation um, it, it may not, it, and in uh, I think many cases is not meant really to convert. Um, it's usually, or very often, it's meant to persuade one's co-religionists to stay where they are. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this kind of thing shows up in a lot of uh, different texts. So for uh, just one example, uh, Ramon Marti, uh, in his enormous work against the Jews, the Pudio Fidei, um, seems to be arguing at vast length, if you know, 484 folios uh, in the original manuscript of it, um, trying to persuade Jews to become Christians. But at the very end of the work, he comes right out and says that the Jews won't convert until Judgment Day. Um, and so whatever he was doing in that work, it wasn't really trying to, to persuade Jews to, to become Christians. Uh, he was speaking, I think, to a very different audience and, and to a Christian audience. Um, so um, I think that um, it's important to uh, bear that, that fact in mind, that disputation, um, whether it's um, public disputation or whether it's in the form of letters written from um, one, one, one side to another, um, very often does the work of speaking to the home community. And and indeed, I think it's really important to pay attention to one of the ba most basic facts that's often neglected in this connection. And that is if, if for example, you're a Latin preacher um, and um, you are um, writing, um, uh, say, a sermon against Islam and you write it in Latin, you are kind of guaranteeing that um, it will never be read by Muslims. Um, uh, so uh, I always think that the language that a text is written in um, apologetic or polemical text is really important in determining what the audience is. And if the audience, the supposed audience um, that the text pretends to be speaking to can't read this language, it's probably not meant to convert them. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions. Um, one is from Alastair Grant, and he asks about the, um, or what is hypothesized about the nature and provenance of the Greek text uh, that has been um, mentioned in your talk? Um, not, not a whole lot has been hypothesized about it. What, what, um, what much of the research on this uh, su suggests um, uh, it, much of the research about the Greek version consists of argumentation that I think is quite persuasive and our team thinks is quite persuasive um, that the Armenian text was translated from Greek. Um, there are lots of different signs in it that it was translated from Greek and there are sections of it that can't be understood in Armenian unless you uh, re-engineer the Greek text that must have laid uh, beneath it. Um, but uh, beyond that, that's kind of where this, the state of the scholarship is uh, right now. And a lot of it was done by my colleagues, uh, especially Sergio Laporta, um, um, making this case, although other, other people have, have, um, have suggested it as well. Um, but there's not uh, very much uh, about the provenance uh, of it that, that has we've been able to determine 
um, or the context or the place, uh, any of that. That's still work that needs to be done. Okay. Um, looks like uh, Lisa Fagan Davis has posted a question about translations, but feels like you already answered it. So we will skip that one. Well, I'll um, say hello to Lisa, though. Uh, yes, she says hello. <laughs> um, and then Anita Savo says, thank you for this informative talk. Whether or not Umar II and Leo had a historical correspondence, are there other factors that might have made them appealing characters for a popular audience interested in religious disputation? Well, one of them uh, um, uh, uh, was mentioned earlier by uh, the earlier question answer that Umar was, was um, thought to be uh, pious and uh, seems like the right kind of guy to do that. Um, I don't know um, that Leo had any particular relation, uh, 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 um, any particular uh, uh, um, uh, reputation for, for piety. Uh, I think one of the things that's important is that they were contemporaries. And so a correspondence could have happened between them. Um, and um, um, so that, that that gives at least the claim um, that th these are correspondence between them um, some validity. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, it looks like another question just popped up and we should maybe make this the last question since we are a little past 630 now at this point. Um, but an anonymous attendee has posted, thanks for the intriguing talk. I was curious about how you and your collaborators have determined which sources would be considered to be more reliable than the other. Uh, does the existence of these multiple manuscripts or letters confirm the historicity of this correspondence? Um, uh, well, we, we don't consider any of them to be more reliable than the others because um, as I've said, um, it's impossible um, to, to find, uh, it's impossible to set these texts out next to each other and distill from them an ur text at all. Um, so there's really no way to know uh, what this thing looked like in its earliest form. And we don't know, there are, there are people who've made the argument that the, the lost Greek version is not the earliest, that the earliest have been in Arabic, although there's really very little evidence uh, of that. Um, and since uh, they're otherwise uh, so different, we have, we have given um, no priority to any version of the text uh, as being more reliable uh, than any of the others. Um, and um, and um, so uh, they don't, uh, um, and do they, do they uh, suggest some historicity to the correspondence? Um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the fact that, well, the notion that Leo and Omar entered into a, a religious disputation by letter is mentioned in early medieval texts in Greek and in Arabic and, um, and in Armenian, um, um, but it's just referred to. Um, and so there was an idea out there that this uh, exchange happened, but uh, it's really hard to find. Uh, there, there's, there's really no evidence in the texts themselves uh, that suggests that, that um, that it, it, it actually did happen um, um, uh, in, in that period when, when Omar, and it's a short period when Omar was caliph and Leo was, was still um, the emperor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe we've answered all the questions. Um, I mean, it is interesting though that the, um, the two emperors did overlap, so it is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. historically possible, and there must yeah. have been some awareness that it uh, was so. a historical possibility. And it, it it seemed to me, based on the little asides about other letters and such, that the the redactors of these letters must have um, tried to create a, a semblance of realism. Uh, 
it seems like they wanted the letters to seem as if they were real, so they weren't purely rhetorical exercises, unless those asides were purely or you know meant to be rhetorical in and of themselves. Sure, sure. But yeah, I have questions for you, but I am going to save them for tomorrow okay. when um, we will have a graduate student chat, which um, Professor Berman has generously agreed to do. That will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, and all graduate students are welcome to attend. Uh, we will send out a reminder email with the Zoom link tomorrow. Um, but uh, were this a normal in-person event, this is when I would ask everyone to join me in a round of applause for you, and thank you for uh, this fascinating and insightful talk that you've shared with us, um, but I will have to speak on behalf of the participants, and thank you uh, for joining us for our first YLMS event of the spring series. Please, everyone, consider coming to the future talks, which we will have in our series. Um, there will be three more. Uh, and keep an eye out for emails about them. Um, so thank you again, Professor Berman. Thank you very much, and thank you for your time and attention, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>